Good afternoon. Welcome to the Orion Bio Networks webinar series. This is a monthly program sponsored by Orion Bio Networks for the brain research and information technology communities. Orion Bio Networks is a nonprofit research alliance whose mission is to accelerate time to cure for brain diseases through the power of shared data and predictive analytics. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me walk you through some logistics. This program is being recorded and will be archived in the Orion Bio Network's YouTube channel and website. The presentation will be approximately half an hour in length to allow 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A. Please use the chat button to post a question. Today our speaker is Dr. Hugo Garris. He is currently Chief Science Officer at Insilico Biosciences, a company that is providing pioneering mechanistic disease modeling services in neuroscience R&D to pharma companies with programs in neurology and psychiatry. Dr. Garris holds a bachelor's degree in theoretical physics, a bachelor's degree in medicine, a PhD in biophysics, and a master's in pharmaceutical sciences. He has almost 20 years of experience in drug discovery and development as a research fellow at the Janssen Research Foundation, where he headed the Alzheimer's Discovery Research Group, and where we first met over 10 years ago. He is on the faculty of the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as, as in the Department of Pharmacology at Drexel University. In his spare time, Higo participates in Olympic luge events because he simply loves the thrill of sledding at 100 miles per hour. In today's webinar, Dr. Hugo Garrett will discuss mechanistic disease modeling, which is based on physical, chemical, and physiologic data from preclinical models. This approach is also called quantitative systems pharmacology, or QSP. I now turn it over to Hugo. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for listening in. I'm um, going to talk today about uh, mechanism-based TNS disease physiology modeling the, with the idea of actually creating a virtual human patient full of today's brain disease. Uh, I've been silico biosciences and just wanted to uh, show us our slides on uh, the company itself relocated in the beautiful city of Philadelphia. I've been around since 2003 and uh, I had the honor, as um, Agali mentioned, to work with Dr. Polyansen for about 20 years which I think is still the most, uh, the most successful drug country in history. So our business model is to provide knowledge integration and support in schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. Today's uh, talk will dwell with the following uh, points. We will uh, have a few slides on the concept of quantitative systems pharmacology as we see it uh, within the company, and go on with a couple of examples for uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, and schizophrenia and end up with a discussion. Okay, so as a background, the mental health is a real societal problem. We have about 2% of the population uh, that experience mental health issues. In these diseases in general, both psychiatry and neurology cost the society uh, about $800 billion per year. It's actually uh, probably going to grow over $1 trillion. Treatment is often incomplete, and especially in Alzheimer's disease, we had a very bad um, success rate uh, between 2002 and 2012. The success rate was only 0.4%. The one drug, 234 attempts actually was clinically successful. So we need a kind of novel paradigm for that. Now, the old paradigm actually, uh, which has been around for about uh, 15 to 20 years, is a genetic trauma, promise uh, in which we actually uh, had the idea that one gene could lead to one protein and one disease. So we had the uh, technology of actually sequencing human genomes, uh, identifying certain mutations or certain SNPs. We would then would actually try to understand the biology and genetic mouse models of that particular mutation of that protein, or nowadays we talk about induced pluripotent stem cells, patients with that uh, certain mutation. And then uh, after understanding the biology by some magic pick, uh, pills actually will be developed and uh, the disease will be cured. However, the reality is um, much different. Uh, in terms of Alzheimer's disease, we have identified both APOE4 as the major risk factor in 1992, and APP mutations in a small subset of familiar Alzheimer's patients also more than 23 years ago. And genetic mites were, were developed very soon after that, but um, uh, more than 20 years later, we still haven't found successful drugs, suggesting that this 
in your hypothesis, it's probably um, not sufficient to explain the variability and the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So in order to actually to think out of the box, we had the idea to look at uh, other successful industries which are more engineering based, like microelectronics, uh, avionics, etc. Whether we could borrow some of the ideas and technologies and approaches to de-risk CNS projects. And so what they have in common, the engineering companies, is that they tend to formalize the collective knowledge, go from information to knowledge. And they use especially advanced modeling and simulation approaches, and they call it computer area design, to capture community-wide expertise and knowledge. So when um, a host of engineers actually is going to retire or is being laid off, um, expertise that they have gathered over the last uh, years is captured within the company. And the other aspect, of course, is that they tend to develop an in silico prototype or actually prove that actually building the actual physical prot prototype. They also embrace complexity. Of course, they have uh, very good uh, approaches for circuit analysis, since that the networks that they are um, uh, looking at often give rise to immersion properties that are not explained by single targets. And of course, mathematical modeling is able to address nonlinear processes as well. What they also have in common is analysis of failed projects. So they do an extensive study of failed clinical trials would be an interesting approach for trying to improve subsequent clinical development in uh, CNS research and development. And then, of course, one of the critiques might be that, of course, those uh, engineering approaches are very well uh, described and, and understood in terms of physics and, and chemistry. And so we need actually to make this output of this uh, possible approach actionable for pharma R&D. We need to cope with incomplete biology knowledge. And so for that, we have a number of approaches that we would call sensitivity analysis, uh, Pareto plots, and Fuzzy statistics that you could apply to the fact that those uh, biological information is incomplete and uh, not very well uh, designed. Okay, so the way how actually we built this QSP model is to try to make a biophysically realistic model of neurons. So you can see that you have uh, an correspondence between the anatomical locations in the human brain and some of the locations in the model. This is a model of the cortical uh, neuronal circuit with both uh, excitatory pyramidal cells, the green ones, and inhibitory cavergic neurons, yellow ones, and a number of different diplotic ultra cells actually modulate uh, voltage-gated ion channels. That cortical network actually drives uh, a number of uh, subcortical basal ganglia cells, uh, like the striatum, those bodies pass externa and um, subatomic nucleus, which is part of the indirect pathway from the D2 positive MSN neurons, and from the other side, the uh, direct pathway from the D1 positive neurons that goes into the GPI and then the thalamus back to the, the cortex. So, this is a biophysically realistic model of a closed cortical striatal thalamocortical loop. The technology that we used is a very old technology, actually has been discovered uh, back in the 40s, the famous Hodgkin Hersch equation. So we calculate at each point in time the actual membrane potential of uh, neurons, and whenever they uh, uh, cross a certain threshold, then we see an action potential. And the underlying idea is that we believe that human behavior is driven by activity of cortical circuits in certain brain regions. So the way how we uh, designed this, uh, this model uh, platform is uh, to actually solve the differential equations that drive the changes in the uh, membrane uh, voltage um, with an array of voltage-gated membrane currents. And the dump type has this battery of um, uh, different uh, voltage-gated ion channels, sodium, potassium, and calcium channels. Uh, we then uh, com combine those uh, individual neurons into micro circuits and into full circuits, and then derive a kind of data diagram, like you see on the right right here, which actually um, shows activation, the action potentials of individual neurons in certain regions of the brain, uh, the pinnal cells, the neurons, time, um, the synaptic strengths of those connections were adjusted so that the spontaneous activity is consistent with experimental data. And so such a model would, would correspond to a certain uh, healthy case situation. Next step actually to bring it more in line with from pharmaceutical R&D is to bring in modulators, neurotransmitters, and also like certain drugs. 
So for that, they built this separate competition model to actually simulate the competition between certain agents, which might be drugs and their metabolites, or drugs and a pet tracer, with the endogenous neurotransmitters, in this case, depending upon uh, the presynaptic and the postsynaptic um, neurophysiology. We then bring in the pathology of uh, certain diseases, which we derive from human imaging and human postmortem studies. So gradually, the model becomes more like a hybrid model, a mixed model between preclinical neurophysiology, clinical pathology, and clinical data as well. We bring in the pharmacology, for instance, the 5HT4 receptor here modulates the uh, the hypotassium channel with a certain linear relationships that, uh, and, and the uh, coupling constant that we all over here, we can then uh, calibrate that coupling constant uh, using clinical data, as shown on the following slides. So the general readout of this um, model is a silico biomarker. We can calculate uh, in the computer model this is, for instance, the local field potential in a subatomic nucleus that we then can analyze using uh, frequency oscillator transformation to identify the frequency of the oscillations. And you can see that in the situation of a low dopamine, like in Parkinson's disease situation, major activity is centered around uh, 30 hertz, which we call the beta band. And in normal dopamine, uh, the major activity is centered around 60 hertz, which is the we then bring in the uh, calibrations with uh, historical trials. So that's, of course, an interesting point because you want to constrain the model as much the clinical data as you can. And so after bringing in the pathology and the pharmacology, we can then look at historical clinical trials. In this case, we use the Parkinsonian symptoms induced by, as a side effect, induced by antipsychotics in patients with schizophrenia. On the y-axis, you see the clinical data. On the x-axis, you see the uh, responding outcomes in the computer model. Each individual triangle is a drug dose combination. You see that we can actually get pretty nice correlation between the model outcome on the x-axis and the clinical outcomes on the y-axis. So the type of clinical skills we have been able to calibrate uh, is summarized particle slides we have uh, an calibration of the PAMS total, which is uh, a an, an clinical scale for schizophrenia called the positive active symptom scale. Um, and again, you see a number of uh, individual dots over here, which are individual dose combinations with their appropriate, uh, uh, with their corresponding clinical outcomes and also then the corresponding model outcomes over here. And again, we have each a pretty nice uh, correlation because many of those drugs, of course, are very complex in nature. They act on many different receptors, which we can capture in our model. We also have a model for negative symptoms in schizophrenia, a model for cognitive symptoms in schizophrenia and in Alzheimer's disease, which is related to the dynamics of this uh, cortical network over here. And I will explain that in more detail later. We have also a model for Huntington disease, Parkinson's disease. All right. Now, what targets are in the a platform in the current version. We have uh, a number of usual suspects. We have dopamine D1 to D4. We have uh, serotonin um, 1A all the way to serotonin 4, and the nergic receptors, putinic receptors, receptors. We have uh, different subtypes of the GABA A subunits uh, and different subtypes of the NMDA subunits, A, B, and C, with their appropriate locations. Amper receptors, we have enzymes like that, amesterase, pump enzyme and on the transporters, and a number of more the recent targets that have been tested in the clinical system, like MGLUR2, MGLUR5, uh, serotonin 6 and 7, um, IT1, for instance. We also implemented recently a, a model for an intracellular uh, pathway, which is with AMP6 PMP pathway, and that, of course, was associated with the target of PD10 popular in the last couple of years for schizophrenia. I will expand a little bit upon a more recent model we uh, developed that brings us into more of the disease modification area, the dynamics of beta amyloid and their effect on cognition. Uh, we have a couple of uh, genotypes in the model that again come from uh, clinical data. So a clinical imaging data, we have genotypes for the COMT-158 genotype, 
the serotonin transporter promoter long versus short form APOE, the D2 receptor, and the calcium channel. And all, many of them, of course, uh, interfere with clinical outcomes like uh, cognition and, uh, and depressive state. And in the future, in the near future, we're developing uh, a more complex spatial temporal model that uh, addresses tau physiology and tau neuropathology. And ultimately, to come up with an, a model that tries to integrate a lot of uh, information uh, about Alzheimer's disease, including the effect of microglial cells, astrocytes, or inflammation as well. So, uh, does this model actually have certain value? Can, can pharma industry use it? We have a couple of examples. Alzheimer's disease, I will uh, show one slide on that. We had a, a prospective blinded uh, prediction of a phase one proof of concept trial of a novel uh, Alzheimer compound in collaboration with Pfizer. We worked with the uh, ADDF to help evaluate clinical candidates of their grantees in terms of the targets for pharmacology and the effect on functional cognition. We are uh, working with a group of charities uh, um, to look at the effect of communication on cognitive performance, and I will uh, explain a little bit about our um, efforts to understand the clinical difference between bapinozumab and solanozumab to passive vaccination strategies that have been uh, tested in clinical Alzheimer's disease. In schizophrenia, we have another uh, blinded prospective prediction of a phase two proof of concept study with colleagues at uh, Janssen. Um, we recently published a paper on identifying the biological driver of uh, responders for uh, a novel antipsychotic called Iloperidon, which is on the market at Senate, owned by Novartis. Um, we identified a biological uh, species-specific uh, basis for the clinical differentiation between aripiprazole and bifepinox. Both of these compounds are partial D2 agonists. One of them is successful in the clinic. Uh, we had another uh, example with Alexab Pfizer to predict the phase two outcomes of a new schizophrenia drug with a novel uh, mode of action. And we looked at the um, those response of with metallic modulation in negative symptoms with schizophrenia. And recently we finished a study on the effect of uh, memantine combined with galantamine combined with antipsychotics uh, and smoking in uh, impairment as with schizophrenia. Testing that this model can also look at the impact of communications in real life clinical uh, setting. For Parkinson's disease, we worked with the Michael G. Fox Foundation to do an empirical screening of the plastic library for uh, non dopaminergic symptomatic tremor or compound. All right, so let's go into detail a little bit uh, about the model. I think one of the major aspects that we need to consider is, of course, target engagement, how much of the compound gets into the brain at the appropriate target. For that, we developed this uh, uh, front-end module the simulation module that uh, simulates the competition between different agents, uh, in this case dopamine, the drug, base and metabolites for the same uh, binding site on postsynaptic or presynaptic receptors. F for this type of modeling also included the neurophysiology of the presynaptic outer release that is uh, driven by the uh, captive uh, feedback of the outer receptors here. We have um, for certain dopaminergic, certain synaptic uh, models we have facilitation depression based on preclinical data, looking at k on k of dynamics of uh, compounds and also tonic versus burst. As an example, uh, the way how you brought in the effect of the com genotype is based on a clinical study, an imaging study from Schriftstein 2008, in which I looked at healthy unmedicated volunteers different uh, com genotypes and the uh, binding of a specific uh, D1 beta tracer like NMC112 um, because the COMT, en en the COMT enzyme drives the breakdown of dopamine, there was a differential binding potential in met, -Met versus volvol subjects and from that study we uh, calculated that the dopamine half-life in our model would actually go from 160 milliseconds for the met, -Met uh, subjects about 100 milliseconds for the volatile subject. And we have done something similar for the other genotypes that we have in the model um, right now. So suggesting that we can develop a kind of individualized model for a subject that has 
uh, a certain combination of those uh, genotypes. So that we can look at the impact of the genotypes of the dose response of a novel investigative test. Okay, so let's now go to uh, the symptomatic treatment model of for Alzheimer's disease. So basically, it's an, uh, a computer model of uh, neuronal circuit. It's uh, green excited cells. It's a four compartment color model and a two compartment GABA inhibitory model with a number of different uh, G-protecable receptors or driving some of the voltage-gated ion channels. This uh, network from the recurrent network, so those uh, neurons talk to each other, uh, and also uh, drive the inhibitory uh, cells, and then conversely, the inhibitory cells drive the battery neurons as well, in addition to having a kind of local uh, network. Uh, the B over here is the effect of the rest of the brain on that network, because obviously, yeah, the current network is not alone in the brain, so we assume a kind of uh, an adult, we assume a Poisson statistic over there, and then we simulate the um, memory stimulus here, like I will show in a moment, we simulate a uh, work memory. So this is um, tied into a more complex model with about 820 neurons, about 10,000 synapses, and a large number uh, uh, of uh, time steps. Um, so basically, the model output is on this graph over here. It's called the state diagram <clears throat> as a function of time. You have the uh, index of individual neurons, and each uh, red dot is an action potential. As you can see, we inject a small current at times equal to two seconds to drive a memory stimulus for about 15 milliseconds, and then the network actually starts to run in synchronization for about six to seven seconds time to keep this memory stimulus in working memory. Of course, the longer the memory span is, uh, the better the performance work memory task. We made the assumption that work memory is an important aspect of um, uh, cognitive deficit in Alzheimer's disease, so we did an eras calibration with a number of direct dose combinations, about 28 of them, that you see on the y-axis effect of prevention on eras change from baseline. For instance, this is the placebo effect at 78 weeks, a loss of about seven points on the ADAS cock change. And each of the individual very uh, dose combinations then has own work memory output from the computer model. And you see there is a nice correlation if you do a parabolic uh, correlation. If you do a linear correlation, you find also a pretty nice uh, and good uh, type correlation there. And this has been published. As an example, we worked with uh, colleagues at Pfizer for a 5 4 partial agonist that they wanted to develop as a diagnostic treatment in uh, scopolamine in Alzheimer's disease. So they wanted to do a phase one trial in humans with scopolamine induced deficit. And our model predicted that the compound actually worsened the cognition because the uh, 5 4 receptor isoforms in the human brain are of the A and the B. Type. And so based on the uh, technical data, we, has, we told them that the compound was going to worsen the cognition other than improve it for two different doses, 5 milligrams and 15 milligrams. So they did a trial anyhow in human volunteers, and uh, so they used Dr. Maid's learning test at two hours. That's the time that both opalamine and the compound reached the peak absorption. You can see that there's a number of errors in the scopolamine, placebo volume. Donetazil has the tendency of reducing the number of errors, but the compound itself has a significantly lower cognitive performance or a higher number of errors, as you can see, uh, all above and beyond the uh, placebo. Okay, uh, a more uh, challenging model is then to go into the amyloid dynamics uh, uh, aspect. And so basically what we want to do in the end is try to integrate a number of different biological processes uh, which are uh, shown over here, um, that uh, gives you the uh, uh, both macroglia, macroglia dependent processes, astrocyte dependent processes, neuronal dependent processes, based on the information that is available uh, about the interactions of different aspects. Ultimately, of course, you need to go to the clinical readouts because that's where you um, constrain the model, and there is a number of uh, biomarkers or endophenotypes that they can use inflammation imaging, CSF, or plasma cytokine levels, live tau and amyloid imaging in Alzheimer's patients, uh, CSF, A-beta, and phosphotau. But ultimately, 
for pharmaceutical R&D, what you need to show is an effect on a functional result, like an eras Koch or um, a CBT. So as a first, very first attempt, we tried to comb combine a number of different processes, namely the impact of uh, synaptic activity on the formation, the synthesis of beta uh, monomers, the breakdown of beta monomers by the enzyme, insulinogenic enzyme, the aggregation of beta monomers into oligomers, and finally into plaques, and then the uh, passive vaccination trials, antibodies, that modulate uh, plaque removal through microglia dependent processes, and ultimately, of course, looking at uh, the effect on an eras koch uh, redal. That's a very ambitious project, but we'll see how far we get there. So basically what we uh, assumed was that monomers have, an, of course, an N equals 1. Oligomers were anything between 2 and 5 um, uh, monomers. And then fibrils were everything beyond 5 monomers. Now, to actually make it very humanized, we used a number of uh, human data, uh, especially the silic data, stable isotope labeling critic data, that have been published from a group of uh, uh, Bateman in New Washington looked at the amyloid synthesis for both A beta 40 and 42 in human patients with Alzheimer's disease. They also combined that with um, forward and backward kinetic parameters for the A beta 1 to 14 40 from um, biochemical in vitro assay. You see the red constants over here. Um, in order to bring it back to the cognitive um, uh, effect, we uh, took a number of papers that actually documented the effect of uh, 1 to 14, 1 to 42, differential impact on glutamatergic transmission. I will show that in a moment that, uh, where that comes from. And ultimately then look at the vaccination interventions using microglia saturation dependent mechanism and kinetics in specific uh, amyloid isoforms. And so we choose two different uh, opposite ways. We choose um, an intervention that actually took away monomers, and that was, of course, represented by solanosumab, the lily uh, compound, versus uh, antibodies that takes away the aggregated forms that was represented by papinosumab. First, we had this uh, simulation of a long life uh, formation of different forms of beta 40 and 42, 70 years, uh, assuming a linear uh, decrease in the insulin enzyme with age. And you see that uh, starting from the age of 75 on, you see kind of peptic, the uh, 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 monomer uh, formation and the oligomer and the formation for all the two, uh, the two isoforms. This corresponds to the clinical observations for kind of sporadic uh, Alzheimer's patients. This is an important slide which we simulated the effect of uh, taking away the fibrils, assuming compounds like papinosumab on the left side, both for the 1 to 42, the 1 to 40, and you can see that uh, for the 1 to 42, the oligomers, which is that curve over here, goes down by about 50%. You go down from about 12 to about 6 here. And the uh, fibrils actually uh, go down uh, also uh, very well. On the other hand, the 1 to 40 go down well, well, but not to the same extent as the 1 to 42. Uh, in contrast, to look at what passive monomer vaccination do, type of solanosumab approach, it would actually decrease the oligomers much deeper about, uh, to about a factor of two nanomoles um, as compared to the uh, passive fibril vaccination. And interestingly, it would actually increase the effect of uh, a beta 1 to 40, suggesting that the human brain doesn't care too much about 1 to 40, but has a number of processes in place that tends to reduce the 1 to 42. And interestingly, I think what people also found in the clinical trials was that uh, with Soranosumab, and it's published in 2012, that the CSF uh, changes in uh, uh, free unbound 1 to 40 and 1 to 42 went in opposite directions. So the 1 to 40 actually went down and the 1 to 42 went up, suggesting that this particular explanation could be uh, one of the reasons for this uh, unexpected observation, clinical CSF sample with Colonel Now, if you bring that in to our uh, calibrated ERAS Koch model, uh, this is a study over 52 weeks. So the improvement, or let's say the change between 50, the baseline and 52 weeks. Uh, for the vapinosumab uh, uh, situation for a kind of a virtual patient trial that have different levels of both 40 and 42 loads, so about 64 different classes of 
of um, combinations of 40 and 42 loads, you see that there is a small amount of patients that tend to have a good result over here. Also, the ones over here for this one, there's not tends to work uh, uh, quite well. In general, you see that the the average uh, reduction with apneurysmap uh, about 5.86 compared to 4.24 points on the Cox scale. Compare that to the placebo level, which is about 6.4 over here, and this is the kind of outcome that, that we get with the models. So apneurysmap is, has a slight effect of about 0.6 better than placebo, but somnurysmap is about 1.7 points better than placebo effect. So suggesting that there is indeed Maybe a reason for uh, pursuing the sound nose map by all of what Lily is actually uh, doing right now. Okay, let's switch to uh, Parkinson's disease, other model that we recently developed. In case we uh, make extensive use of this uh, very detailed corticostriatal alamocortical loop, uh, in which we actually looked at the oscillations, the local field potential in this area called the cytomic nucleus. As we have seen before, if you go from low dopamine to high dopamine, you shift the um, frequency of oscillations from the beta band, about 30 hertz, to the gamma band, about 60 hertz. And so this is on the <coughs> calibration that we have shown before with uh, the computer model and the clinical outcomes, in this case from the psychotics and Parkinsonian symptoms. The interesting part is that this readout here is actually uh, confirmed to be present in uh, the human brain as well. So this is a um, result from experimental study uh, with Parkinson's patients that have been surgery, uh, surgically um, uh, prepared for deep brain stimulation. And you can also record from the same electrodes in the nucleus. And you see that if the patient is on off l -dota, so has the bradykinesia rigidity, they get a high beta uh, power here and almost zero gamma power. And so when the patient actually is responding to L-DOPA with, uh, with good results, beta power declines and the gamma power actually starts to increase. And then if the patient actually is driven into dyskinesia, then uh, the gamma power still increases further. So the beta over gamma ratio, which has been measured experimentally in patients, is a good measure for the uh, clinical symptoms as well. And that's what we tell also over here. This is our, our model beta over gamma ratio as a function of dopamine depletion, which is the pathology in our model, and we see an increase beta over gamma ratio with increasing levels of uh, dopamine depletion. Uh, therapeutically, if you bring in L-DOPA as an, uh, an intervention that uh, affects both the D1 and the D2 positive uh, MSN neurons, you see a kind of slightly uh, bigger decline, bigger improvement. Uh, as a function of the dose compared to the same dose, the same receptor occupancy of D2 agonists only, combined with the clinical observations as well. And <clears throat> finally, this is an example of our model for l dyskinesia. So we have a very low bed of the gamma ratio now in the particular distance. We bring in an MGOR5 negative allosteric modulator or inhibition. And we see that it actually is able to increase the bed of the gamma, so bring it back to normal. Uh, with a kind of inverse U-shaped dose response situation. And this type of dose response is something that we see often when a therapeutic intervention is aimed at both uh, uh, glutamates or GABA because the brain has this kind of feedback circuits that avoid uh, having too much impact on one of the two. Uh, finally, to close up, uh, I will show some examples on the model that we developed for schizophrenia, uh, which by itself is, of course, a disease uh, that has a, a triplet, a diet of symptoms. It's a condition of positive symptoms. So people actually start to hear uh, uh, voices and see hallucinations. There is a large contribution of negative symptoms. So people, uh, subject actually tends to become, um, uh, uh, let's say, not, not very active in social life, withdraw from social life, withdraw from friendships. Uh, and then, of course, cognitive symptoms, which they see the world in a kind of distorted uh, reality. And so uh, it's a substantial burden because only 4% of the treated patients can return to normal social functioning. The disease starts in adolescence. So a large number of patients start to see the, have the first symptoms between the age of 18 and 24. Uh, and of course, 
there is no cure for it, and they need to be treated for the rest of their life. So, uh, as an example, uh, this was a study that we did with uh, people at uh, Janssen for a novel compound. They had a, you know, a phase two clinical trial in which they tested three compounds, uh, three doses for the same compound as a comparator to olanzapine. So, for, with regard to the pan-total prediction, we were able to, in line with uh, actually observed outcomes, so the, viral, the maroon is here, the model outcomes, with a 95% prediction interval, and then the clinical trial results are in blue. That's for the placebo volume. The volume in that trial was, of course, relatively high, six points. And because our model has been constrained by clinical data dating back all the way to the late 80s, our placebo effect tends to be a much more uh, realistic placebo effect. But the most important uh, finding, actually, which was completely unexpected, is in terms of the uh, motor symptoms, the EPS liability. <clears throat> so the model predicted that the uh, model based selection showed that the compound would have a higher EPS liability than the uh, active comparator olanzapine, uh, which is intermediate between the placebo and the, um, and the active, uh, new active compound. And the clinical trial uh, actually unexpectedly resulted in the same trend. So the, the three doses of the uh, compound uh, showcased or featured a higher uh, incidence of uh, EPS symptoms in the phase two study as compared to uh, olanzapine. This is completely unexpected because the compound uh, did not show any EPS liability in the traditional uh, preclinical models mm -hmm. and I think even in primates. But our model actually predicted that the compound had this uh, EPS liability, which was super. Now, the last part of this uh, schizophrenia pathology is an important part, which is the cognitive impairment. As shown earlier, cognitive impairment is one of the biggest hurdles for uh, patients to come back to professional life. And so we actually developed this, uh, this cortical model in which we have the pathology induced by um, a reduction in cortical phenocambine levels, and first last week there was a paper coming out uh, quantifying the uh, lower dopamine level in the cortex of patients with schizophrenia. Uh, we had decreased NMDA function, uh, which has been documented in many different patients, increased background noise, and based on the theory of David Lewis from Pittsburgh, also a dysfunctional GABA. Uh, so we bring in all that pathology, we're able then to um, calibrate model with existing um, uh, clinical outcomes. So this is uh, again a calibration in which we compared a um, uh, clinical outcome, in this case the uh, two-pack per memory outcome, for a number of interventions, as you can see over here, about 17, with the appropriate corresponding uh, model outcome. So we have both schizophrenics and healthy controls with different genotypes and with different interventions. And you can see that the correlation is in the 0.76 range, pretty, pretty good correlation. As one example, we looked at the uh, effect of uh, combination treatment because uh, in real life, but also in clinical trials, patients are on existing medications to which you add for a uh, novel investigative drug. And so this is an example that we did in which we added um, risperidone to clozapine, and you can see that uh, pharmacology of the compound is very promiscuous. The number of different that are affected by this uh, type of four uh, units, so clozapine, it's a metabolite, risperidone, and it's major metabolite as well. And so when you add uh, risperidone to clozapine, you see that the work memory outcome actually goes down. This is a special patient trial with the same number of patients but in a clinical trial as well. So we were able to reproduce the clinical outcome of that uh, experimental result and identify the reasons why uh, risperidone had such a, a negative effect on clozapine. This is important because in many situations of clinical trial development, what you do is you add your investigative drugs to a number of existing drugs so that they all work the same, and that's certainly not the case. All right. so. Um, to uh, finish up, uh, this is the kind of cloud chart I would actually try to convey to you for documentation trial in which you add a compound to existing compounds. You have the pharmacology of human metabolites that comes from 
uh, experimental data, you do some PK, PK interaction modeling. It's all very well known right now. Um, you anticipate the target engagement, but then actually you start using the QSP approach to um, uh, start doing the virtual patient modeling in terms of chronopharmacodynamics, in terms of uh, genotypes, in terms of communication, in terms of patient populations, so as to identify the uh, combinations or genotypes that might harm your um, uh, clinical uh, dose response uh, and uh, improve the chances of success which you then can actually select an active R1 and an active R2. We have a couple of, uh, at least one example in which we take a look at the phase 3 trial and that section of the antipsychotics novel compound was added actually determined the dose response uh, substantially, point that uh, you would see a negative trial. Okay, just some philosophical reflections at the end, what are the barriers to virtual patient simulation in CNS or in D? Obviously, people always say we don't know enough about human biology. That's true. Oh, quite a lot, but not enough. But still, the current state, current business is uh, actually um, committing billions of dollars with available limited data, clinical development of drugs that show efficacy in non-validated patient level models. And uh, Alzheimer's disease is just an example of that. There is too much variability in human patient population, but on the other hand, uh, the industry is progressing drugs that show effect in, in quite homogeneous, ethically animal models without communications and without confounding genotypes. That's something that we can add to the, to the problem here. Uh, it's difficult to grasp complex nonlinear interactions, and so the alternative is then to just go for a linear hypothesis, like uh, reducing beta amyloids will improve Alzheimer's. But it's much more complex than that, as we showed. Modeling can only provide guidance post hoc, explain why drugs fail in clinical trials, but I've shown you that there is a couple of situations in which we can prospectively um, predict uh, outcomes. And then, Mathematics cannot capture complete physiology and pathology. It's true. The model is certainly uh, very incomplete. Uh, but I would say that engineers didn't wait for the ground unified theory of physics to develop a number of uh, useful and actionable um, products that we use every day. And then, of course, uh, for a certain number of uh, wet lab ex experimentalist mathematics 101 trauma can be an, uh, uh, still an, an, a problem there. Uh, last slide, where can we actually be helpful with this approach? Uh, ultimately, we want to go up the food chain as far as we can, and I think the most important um, the most important contribution that we can bring is target validation. What's a good five network outcome? We can also uh, support uh, multi-target medicinal chemistry programs. I strongly believe that we will never be able to have an impact on Alzheimer's disease or any CNS disorder with a highly selective uh, compound. We need to have an effect on different uh, circuits at the same time. We can look at the off-target pharmacology of a candidate compound and explore mode of action of new compounds. And then in terms of our clinical development, we can look at the full dose response estimation. And there are two more readouts that I didn't discuss of the model. Uh, one is pharmacology, the other one is both the fMRI for looking at target engagement in case you don't have um, uh, real uh, data tracers. We can do virtual patient trials uh, for late clinical development on biology and variability as a uh, variability parameter, looking at the impact of communications and genotypes. And in post-marketing, we can look at the guidance of polypharmacy, what should actually patients take, what, what combinations of drugs are harmful to patients. We can look at switching paradigms so from oral uh, formulations to long-acting injectables. Uh, and ultimately, our long-term dream is to uh, provide us a platform for personalized medicine in which you would make a suitable model for individual patients um, in using public data, using uh, imaging data, so that we can test a number of uh, available treatments in the in silico model and identify the one with the best benefit of risk ratio. Having uh, immediately the best uh, solution for certain patients. All right, so these are my collaborators over the years. Um, special thanks to uh, Aiden Spears and Patrick Roberts who have been with us for quite some time. 
um, Ruggiero Scorcioni, Marci Radrevic, uh, Lee Finkel, passed away a couple of years ago, uh, John Danny, and Robert Carr. Welcome, any questions? Thank you very much, Hugo. I think Alden has uh, some questions from the audience for you now. In terms of what you said about sodium, potassium, and calcium, I mean, those are all accelerants in terms of brain activity. What are your thoughts in terms of the implications for, for Alzheimer's disease? Because we all know that brain connectivity and, I mean, it's, it's a hard thing in terms of the way that neurons interconnect, but what are your thoughts about the implications for those in terms of Alzheimer's disease? Um, yes, so the, the model right now is uh, limited in the sense that it describes an individual circuit in, in the cortical area. And mm -hmm. obviously, um, uh, the human brain consists of many different cortical areas that are linked to each other and have different functions as well. And so, uh, connectomics is one area, one, one technology that allows to identify the changes in the connectivity between different brain regions um, as a function of the disease itself. So our uh, long-term goal is actually to be able to link those different particular regions with each other. And so actually go into a kind of connectomics simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, each of the particular regions might have different uh, populations of uh, excitatory cells or inhibitory cells or even different receptors, depending upon the, uh, the immunocytic chemistry studies that have been done in the human brain. So we're painstakingly following the research that uh, is currently being done in a number of German laboratories in which they actually identify the type of potential expression of neurotransmitters, receptors, and, and cell types in different areas of the human brain. And so that ultimately will give us some idea about how to build an um, in-silico model for specific regions and how to connect them together and then actually try to simulate connectomics results or a connectomics imaging study um, in, in Alzheimer's disease and try to restore connectivity because ultimately, as you mentioned, um, human behavior is driven by activities in certain brain regions and, and the way on how they interact with each other. Yeah, and, and actually an, another question related is, I mean, you talked about GAB-A, which is a, a sodium channel, um, but what about GABA-B? in terms of being a negative or, or at least a, a quiescent or a negative channel that is in the brain? Yeah, I mean, right now we have the voltage-gated uh, GABA, GABA-A channel uh, that's present on the and the neurons, and uh, we don't have the GABA-B uh, target uh, right now. The GABA-B target is a metabotropic uh, receptor that actually modulates the release of GABA uh, as a presynaptic receptor. Um, and as such, modulates the, the tone or the um, uh, equilibrium between excitation and inhibition. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, important in Alzheimer's disease because uh, as time progresses with the pathology, the pathology first acts on uh, the primal cells with the long association fibers and uh, much less on the shorter inhibitory uh, local uh, circuits. And mm -hmm. so what happens over time is that the inhibitory circuits tends to take over um, the uh, balance there and shut down the network. And so one of the reasons that, and we have um, studied that in our model, one of the reasons that um, an NMDA antagonist like um, memantine is uh, beneficial in moderate to severe patients is that this compound actually uh, acts preferentially on the NMDA receptors that drive the GABA uh, input. So we're blocking that, that uh, drive actually, the inhibitory tone is uh, reduced and the network can actually go back to a normal uh, situation. So uh, I think many of the situations that we encounter in its disorders is in a question of uh, excitation and inhibition balance. And so that's very hard to understand without my type of modeling. And then what about MGLUR5? I mean, that one was one that was discovered relatively late in the game as a metabolic receptor. Where does that play into to the Alzheimer's scenario? The MGLOR5 is implemented in two places in the, in the model. So uh, this metabotropic glutamatergic receptor actually from the, the group one um, uh, class um, 
act, uh, is modulating both the after hyperpolarization uh, currents on uh, potassium channels and as such changes the timing of uh, firing uh, as well in a cortical circuit. That's one, one place in which we have the MR5 uh, sitting based on, on the clinical data. The other, the other uh, uh, place, the other uh, localization is on the, on the hyperdirect pathway from the motor cortex into the cytomeric nucleus. Um, and we have shown that uh, blocking the MR5 at this level uh, will reduce the amount of dyskinesia and we turn the beta of the gamma ratio from a low value to a higher value. So we have two types of, of, of localizations for the MGOR5. There is no direct effect of MGOR5 for Alzheimer's disease right now. Um, uh, one of the possibilities might be that the uh, actual potential dynamics in the cortical circuit uh, might be um, a, a beneficial effect of MGOR5 modulation, but we haven't studied that in, in detail. Okay, thank you. So, Magali, do you have any additional questions you want to um, put forward? Uh, so, I had an additional question around, um, I noticed in some of your circuitry that you have uh, the amygdala and forebrain connection um, mapped out. So, I'm wondering about the applicability of this, of your uh, network platform to post-traumatic stress disorder um, because that's a, uh, it's been demonstrated that the amygdala hippocampal prefrontal cortex circuitry is, is implicated in PTSD, and I'm wondering if you think that platform could be useful for um, understanding the mechanisms and pharmacology associated with PTSD. Yes, it's a very good question, and, and so we have been thinking about that as well. Uh, so in principle, the elements are there, and the template uh, is there, but they haven't really implemented a particular mechanism of PTSD as such. So um, we are thinking about expanding the, uh, the model for other CNS disorders, um, notably uh, depression, and as you mentioned, PTSD might be one of them. Um, but right now we don't have it uh, actually, uh, let's say, constrained or calibrated in a kind of clinical outcome. Because ultimately you want to have a model that's really constrained by clinical data. Uh, and and uh, that's because it needs to be helpful for patients out there and, and, and companies that develop novel interventions or addressing those clinical skills. So it's, it's on, the, on the project list that we haven't really done uh, a lot with the or on the patient. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and if I, if I can just ask one final question. So what are we doing wrong? Just in terms of compound development and ensuring that we're achieving what needs to be achieved for the best patient outcomes. Well, I think uh, I listed a couple of, uh, of issues here in this particular uh, slide. Um, so the current, let's say, way of, of doing business in, in pharma R&D is, is based on uh, clinical development of drugs that show efficacy Unvalidated the clinical model models, uh, and that addresses the issue about knowing enough of human biology. Yes, it has been shown over and over again that the translation ability of road models to the clinical, especially the CNS clinical situation, is very, very uh, limited. So um, I think by trying another uh, attempt, then the clinical models and hope that the outcome will be better. It's not going to work. Um, other aspects are limitations of animal models in terms of the homogeneity of the genetic background, um, in terms of uh, avoiding to test uh, co-medications and genotypes, which ultimately are driving uh, uh, clinical scales in a human patient trial. Um, the, uh, and I think the third point is very important. I think the, the basic hypothesis of linearity is I think a wrong hypothesis. Um, the human brain is much more complex than, than a linear hypothesis. Um, so companies are, 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 say, advancing compounds on, on the premise that addressing bad amyloid loads will cure Alzheimer's disease. We have seen that it's much more complex than that. Um, so I think we have a number of, of issues in the current way of doing business of doing research and of and progressing compounds that to a certain extent can be addressed 
partly by uh, Pavlov's mechanism based modeling. And um, I see that a little bit more and more companies tend to become interested in, in out of the box uh, technologies and platforms because they see over and over again that business as usual doesn't work. Alzheimer's disease or in schizophrenia uh, or, or in other CNS indications. So um, I think, yeah, we, we can identify a number of problems and we can actually try to address some of those problems, maybe not perfectly, but at least to a certain extent, to help identify red flags in, in, in R&D projects uh, before we go into very expensive clinical trials. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, I thank you very much for a phenomenal presentation, Hugo. I think uh, you've given us all a food for thought, and I, I look forward to seeing what work in silico biosciences does moving forward and hopefully looking at tau physiology as well. Yeah, that's our next project. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you very much, Hugo.